There it is, fly it in, Kenny. Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show. I am, as always, chat show. How the hell are you? Where the hell are you? Are you writing to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com? Are you? Well, you should be. Uh, you're going to doctor that one, Kenyon. Did you do that? You're going to put that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to put some of the stevia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you caught us just in time for my guests and I to get some fresh hot coffee. And I want to tell you something, folks. Nothing quite like it. Uh, yeah. Welcome. But we're here at the uh, West Side Comedy Theater uh, where we come to you live. Again, write to us. Let us know how you do us. The, are you doing us on the YouTube? Are you catching us later on the Earwolf? What the hell is your deal? Share. KPCSFanMail at gmail.com. Sam Levine, ladies and Jews. Hey, Kevin Pollack. Uh, how are you? I'm great, man. How are you doing today? Are you okay with the uh, New York Yankees going uptown and downtown on your Cubs? You know, uh, here's the thing. Yesterday, that was a rough one, okay? That, that, was, a, that was a tough loss. Uh, Friday, I don't... It's still. It's going to sting. It's going to sting for a while, that, that three-run homer by Gardner in the ninth. But here's the thing. That's one bad pitch. They didn't play a bad game. They threw one bad pitch. Excellent point. So... Uh, uh, so only 7,500 games left in the season. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it definitely hurts, but uh, I don't know. I feel good about them today. They're taking on the Yanks tonight. They're the game of the week on ESPN, so I encourage everyone to watch and nice cheer, little for, plug cheer for the right. For the television coverage. Yep. That's very nice of you. Well, they're a big sponsor, not of the show, but of me personally. That's now. right. Yeah. Uh, Jamie is hosting a baby shower. Baby shower. A first for her. Yeah. And uh, she was doing quite well prior. Okay. I'll see how she does when I get home. <laughs> I have a feeling it all went beautifully. Fantastic. Um, let's get right to our guests. Yeah. Um, well, for, I guess I should tell you upcoming shows, Rob Corddry, Dave Keckner, Dave Foley, and to round out the Dave trifecta, Dave Couillet. Uh, and then reconfirmed, oh. Sunday, October 29th, oh. Ricky Gervais. Oh, boy. Going to be sitting here at this table. Oh, boy. Until he backs out. Eh. For now, it's locked and reconfirmed. Uh, all right, my guest today uh, is an international superstar. I don't know how else to put it. He's <laughs> looking around <laughs> for who might be coming through the door, but it is in fact him. Um, he is a citizen of a few countries. We'll talk about that and, and many other things. Uh, and a, a friend for uh, quite a while now, which I'm most uh, excited about. Mr. Craig Ferguson, welcome back. Hey, thank you. Thank you, audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I particularly enjoyed the sports talk there. Well done. Yeah. I feel like I'm becoming the company of real men. You, you have the uh, physique that suggests you, at one point you were, uh, uh, it was suggested to you to play sports. What happened? Uh, well, I played a bit of rugby when I was at school. Yeah. Uh, but it's very rough. <laughs> Sure yeah, I preferred theater. <laughs> right. Which is not as rough. Not nearly as rough. And more tight. Yeah, a little, yeah. More, <laughs> well, a little more Merkin. Yeah, yeah. Than that, rugby. No, I played rugby at school. I was in the school rugby team for a while when I was a kid. But it's, it's, I actually, I, I, I was thrown off. I was sent off of a rugby pitch once for excessive force. And that means? That means it was too violent even for rugby. How, what had you done? I, I took objection to the way a gentleman on the opposing side I was dealing with the, the game, and we got into it a little bit. He's he was he was also taken off as, as well, uh -huh. so it was not my fault. Was uh, once everything calmed down, or a few days got was it a, a point of pride or embarrassment? Uh, how old it was you? embarrassment, really. I was about fifteen. Yeah, uh, I was embarrassed because I, you know, it's bad sportsmanship. That's right. And um, and also I, uh, but now I don't care. I was no. fifteen. They're lucky it was just as as easy as that. Things got a lot worse later on. Yeah, but it was. Um, but never uh, football. But never during rugby. It never played football or or we call it soccer. Soccer? Uh, yeah, I was never good enough. You know, there's a lot of people who are really good. I don't know what happens in Scotland because there's a lot of people who are really good at yeah. it. And then the Scottish national side, not so good. <laughs> yeah. We had a, uh, a soccer hooligan on the show. Oh, yeah. Vinnie Jones. I didn't know they actually did appearances. Vinnie Jones. Oh, Vinnie. Well, yeah, he became yeah, an actor. Yeah. Vinnie was actually, a, you know, he was a good player too. He I mean, was. Don't let him kid you. I mean, it's all part of the mystique, but he could play the game. Yeah, he could. Yeah. Um, it's all part of, oh, yeah, oh, tough geezer. He has, he has a tough geezer, but, but he also could play. <laughs> yeah. you, don't get to, you don't get to play in the England squad without being able to play football right. or soccer. Yeah. So uh, he's both tough and a good sportsman. 
I think I kind of do. I do. I have a thing for him. <laughs> Sounds like it. First of all, he's nowhere near the good sportsman you uh, just gave him credit for because there's a very famous photograph. Oh, on, him with on the internet. Going. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> but Gaza needed that from time to time. <laughs> I don't, I don't, that's really? Plenty, yeah. Plenty of people thought, you know what, Paul, you do need your nuts squeezed a bit for time. Uh. I think he did the nation a service when he gave. He, he, he even helped Gascoigne out. He helped him out. You know, it kind of woke him up a little bit. You know. Well, ah. that will wake most. Uh, people. It is a horrendous photograph. Though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you did play a little bit of the rugby because I felt like you know when you're a kid, especially, and you, you don't know which way life is going to take you, and you have the size that you had even then. There's got to be a natural either drift or request or suggestion. Hey, play for us, kind of thing. There was a bit of that. The only thing was that I I came of age in a time when any kind of establishment cooperation was seen as uh, traitorous. You know, I was I wasn't right in the middle of punk rock. I was actually a little bit young for it. Right. So I was very impressionable when the the Pistols were playing in the Hundred Club. I was 15 years old. So it was you know I really believed it. You know they didn't believe it, no. but I believed it. <laughs> That's you know? right. So they were so, performing. Right. So the, the rebellion uh, aspect, which still kind of plays into a lot of my thinking. So the idea of being part of a sports team for your school was not really an option. It wasn't cool. So that was uh, an organic thought for you, that, that, that terminology, uh, that way of thinking just happen with you or was it it was punk rock 100 percent what happened was that you know malcolm mclaren sold the swindle to you know to sell trousers and 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 shirts to to people and get the sex pistols to be famous but i was young and i bought the whole thing yeah and and so the idea of rebellion and all that kind of stuff just it, it kind of got hardwired in you know that the neurons that wire together fire together thing i was like that's the way so even now you know, when, when I was working at CBS, the only reason I could have worked at CBS when I was doing the late night show was because actually the, the time slot that I was doing was owned by David Letterman. Right. And David Letterman I, I'd be okay with, but CBS... But the, he was the anarchist. For right, oh, that's right. So it was kind of like, it was kind of like working for, you know, TV punk. Yeah. You know, so it was okay. I felt, I felt a little led, although there were nights... Sometimes I think, you know, it gets a hold of you a little bit and, and you can overthink it. Like, I remember I did a, a corporate gig, you know, sure. doing the, the, the highly paid corporate gigs that nobody talks about. That really. rarely go well because yeah. they didn't pay to see you. You're right. Just no, that simple. Right. So I'm doing the T-Mobile annual event in, Damn Las, right you are. in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, they're enjoying their warm lobster and stuff. And <laughs> a couple of days before, nothing says comedy is going to be great like a room full of people like, <laughs> how yeah. have sales been this year? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But the, um, I, was, uh, I, was, I was going to do this gig in this corporate gig in Las Vegas and about a week before Steve Jones from the Pistols called me up and said, uh, no, the Pistols, are get back, we're getting back together for the thing. And I was like, yeah. He said, we want you to introduce us. At the uh, at the Roxy, or I think it was the Roxy or the Kino sure. or something on Sunset, and I couldn't do it because I was I felt terrible about it because you know, I was doing the gig. corporate gig, and I was like, that, they, this is emblematic of how much of a hack and a sellout I've become. And then I saw Jonesy about six months later, and I said I felt such a hack, and he went, "What are you talking about? That's what we were fucking doing as well. We were selling out, weren't we? Getting <laughs> back together for money. It was just for money." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yeah, we didn't miss each." other yeah it was like, <laughs> so he made me feel a lot better about it yeah oh good well so that was that yeah but it stayed with you all these years it still does I think a little bit I still get embarrassed I get embarrassed on a on red carpets and stuff like that when you know when they ask you those fucking Hollywood pre-prepared questions so that you know hey do do you like Gwyneth Paltrow's hair and all that stuff like leave me the fuck alone <laughs> I always feel so uncomfortable yeah. around all of that that eventually I think that was a lot to do with the fact that I thought right, enough with late night right. was that although I didn't do much of it there was more of it creeping in with you know with social media and you know this kind of thing and you know that everybody has to not this one but but you know you have to try and tweet a thing or make a thing go viral or and also you if you're not booking the guest yourself no you're not right if you have in fact no say in it you're going to get some guests that as as organic and real as you can try to make it you're just disinterested well that happened 
Not too much, really, because right. for I can be interested in anybody for eight minutes, you know. So, so even I remember doing the show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here. <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I can, I can, you know, I can sure. talk to anybody for that. So if it's like the hardest people to talk to were people who were shy, right? Really. So it mostly. You know, usually musicians and, sp and athletes right. who are being forced into that position, it's not what they want to do. No. Like actors talk about themselves, Jesus Christ, try and stop them. Right. You know, but, and comedians are fine, and you know, broadcasters, sure. writers sometimes it's a little tricky. They spend a lot of time alone. Yeah, but a lot of writers were good. I think if you talk to writers about what they had been writing about, right. then you, it was okay. Research. But right. the, uh, but musicians usually have a hard time. And, and athletes. There were a few notable exceptions, but yeah, because it's it not what they do. You know, it, was it ever? Uh, I don't know. If strenuous. Is, that's too too strong of a word. Because the thing is, uh, comedians want to be rock stars. Rock stars sometimes think they're funny. Yeah. So when they come onto a chat show, everybody thinks they're funny. <laughs> right. Everybody thinks they're funny. It is the one profession, and I've I've uh, maybe said this a thousand times where people get to dabble in you know, no one dabbles in dentistry but at a party anyone can tell a joke and yeah you and tell a joke t telling a joke is like saying to uh, you know someone who conducts a symphony officer hey <laughs> what do you think <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know it's like yeah, it's not the same thing no no uh, you know I was I was on stage last night explaining that to the second audience where were you in Kansas I was Kansas City uh, what, what there's was an the improv game? there all right yeah, it's okay. like a mini theater kind of thing yeah yeah nice little setup I'd never even heard of this place it's it's nice it's you like are uh, not on the west side and I think no, I don't come to the West Side. This is the only time I've been in years to the West Side. This yeah. is come, I'm here for you. We sent a Sherpa to get yeah, you here. I, <laughs> we had to Croy, it used to be, see, LA's shit now. LA used to be a great time. Sure. You know, you'd get around. But now, since smartphones and Uber, you can't move. Like, everybody is like... Mm, mm, and like ways. That. And mm? ways. And ways. And there's and no more shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. Right. There's no there's no quiet streets. And it's like, you know... And also, I, you know, my hip hurts. <laughs> and I have to go to the bathroom. I, uh, I was visiting with a, 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 a character actor friend who recently moved to Kansas City. Been in, in L.A. a very, very long. Brian Doyle Murray. I don't yeah. know if he uh, ever... I know who he is. Yeah, I don't yeah. know him, yeah. So wonderful. His uh, wife is from there. So they, they packed up and and move the hell out. Yeah. Has that crossed, oh, I'm crossed oh, I'm the moving. mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as my oldest boy's finished school, I'm out. You're done. Yeah. Yeah, he's just uh, two more years. The oldest? Yeah. 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 So th the six-year-old's going. Yeah, he's coming. Well, I'm taking him with me, yeah. Are you He'll sure? be eight by then. But, I'm still, <laughs> but I still think I'm going to take him. I, I still think. Yeah, well, yeah. you know what? Yeah, we'll see how his behavior is. <laughs> yeah, all right. You're right. Well, you're saying Let's he's, not commit to it yet. You're saying he's <laughs> considerably athletic, you were saying beforehand. Um, yeah, he is what? very, very, uh, very athletic, very, um, very spirited young man. Well, you know, so, uh, some of the questions that I found myself writing down were, when do you pass along certain things that influenced you, be it music, movies, comedy, or, or did you do any of that with the oldest? Yeah, I think you do. I think it's an organic thing. I made no decisions about my kids other than to uh, protect them and love them and listen to them. Right. You know, so the, uh, the temptation that I have to resist, I don't know how you feel about this, but the tempt I was always trying to remember that this is not Glasgow in the 1970s and the skill set that my boys require is not the same as what I required. They don't need to know certain things. Uh, there are certain, you know, uh, skills that I learned. It's inappropriate for them to, to right. be looking at. They don't need to know how to defend themselves in that way. Right. I mean, they can do, you know, uh, karate and martial arts and all and that stuff. And you can ask Siri now where to bury a body. Yeah, I, that's not how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> she was saying a foundry? That was one of the first a quarry. Thing, a quarry. A quarry, yeah. It's, are you crazy? <laughs> that's not how. It's the first place they look. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jim Jeffries, we spoke, and he talked about his difficulty parenting. One of the ones that, that was striking for him is the daily debate of wanting to give his son a better life than he had versus making it all too easy for him. Specifically, he spoke about the inner conflict of wanting to go on a great vacation now that he's earned it, finally, but 
he doesn't want his son to have this spoiled he, he wants him to have the tough shitty vacations that he had as a kid so that he can appreciate i understand right? that i understand that but it's not my thought process I, and i'll tell you why when i was when i was a kid the enemy the, as far as i could understand were the english mm -hmm. and the english upper classes they were the, you know, the people in the upper classes, if they were Scottish or English, it was really a class war thing. And, and anyone who came from privilege was to be despised and, and you know, they were, they were mortal enemies. Now, you grow up, you get older, you know, life gets complex, you meet people, you run into people from different walks of life. And I meet people who are from that background. Wow. And I'm like, well, that's just nonsense. You know, so that way of thinking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the the essence of of uh, you know that that kind of uh, xenophobia. That mm -hmm. you know that it's like oh they're different. Well, I remember making a film in Russia, and my uh, translator, who's this lovely girl, who said we were told during the Soviet era that you would eat us if if you got in here. Like you know you like the the Americans and you know, like the West were cannibals, wow. and that you would eat us. So perhaps the information, I mean, I wouldn't, I'm a vegan, perhaps you would, but the, the, uh, <laughs> I'm a carnivore. But the, 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 the lies that, you know, fake news is nothing new. No, no, you know, no. It's, uh, it's been going around for a while. I think in, uh, during... Well, they Nazi called it Germany, propaganda. Yeah, Goebbels was in charge of fake news That's for right. Hitler, right? Yeah. But someone just recently showed me a couple of Norm MacDonald uh, weekend update on SNL saying, and now the fake news. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a buzz, it's another clickbaity buzzword yeah. viral fucking, how many been, tweets have you got and you're fucking, oh my God, <laughs> drives me crazy. Yeah. Comedy's been using the fake news forever. Yeah. What, what we do in comedy is sometimes we say the opposite of what's true. Right. And that's called a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, un, uh, until you're 18, not so much. I'm, I've, I'm, I'm always amazed, generation after generation, how the subtlety of sarcasm is just lost on the young. Well, it, it, things change as you get older. Yeah. I mean, l like the the comics that I, the comics that I grew up, you know, idolizing, a lot of them are dead. But of course, that would make sense chronologically, wouldn't sure. it? Sure. Um, and was that from? From what source were you gathering this influence? Records? Records, yeah. 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 How many albums? Any Americans get in there? Yeah, yeah. Steve Martin was in there. Richard Pryor was in there. I, you know, pre-rape Bill Cosby was there. You know sure. what I mean? Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, uh, yeah, it turns out it wasn't pre-rape Bill Cosby, but it, it was, uh, <laughs> but I didn't know about it. Turns out he was very successful while we were being fans. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel very uh, weird about all that. It's like it's uh, filthy. I started at ten years old, lip syncing his first album. Oh yeah, that that's was my right. introduction yeah, to yeah, that's right to wanting to be a performer because I I saw this voice or heard this voice coming out of the stereo as I told you, and my parents losing their minds laughing. I know. It's like it's like when you have to. It's when you learn a very dark secret about someone that you adored is. It's a very odd process. Yeah. Uh, We've all got secrets. Sure. Uh, every now and then they less, become... I think less so now than then. I think when you were famous and like before all of the enter tweets, uh, it, that you could keep secrets more. You yeah, know, but before your computer had a camera where people yeah, could... Well, yeah, people can just like listen to you when you're... Apparently the government can listen to you. I've got one of those Japanese toilets. I think it checks out my ass every... <laughs> yeah, like, I think I'm actually doing a, a, a special porn site every time I take a hump <laughs> You just reminded me of something that I, I debated whether I should share or not. This is how old I've become. Uh oh. On the plane. Yeah. Thought I locked the bathroom door. Oh no. Yep. Who walked in? Hot girl? Don't know. Oh. Had my back to him. Oh. I was finishing Finishing up? You were masturbating? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I was finishing the cleanup process oh. while standing because there's no room while you're... Yes! Jeez. Oh, they got amazing. the one-eyed goat. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go? Do you go from the back or do you go down and you do the reach around? Reach well, around? Oh, I think boy. we've discussed that enough. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, you're, listen, your curiosity is healthy. Um, but I, be, I realized in that heartbeat, oh, I just became the guy that's that old that... that you know, I, I refuse to subscribe to the notion that there's any shame in aging, though. I think it's funny. I know. didn't think so until that moment. Right. I think it's funny. I think it's okay. I've done plenty of shameful things in my youth. You sure, know? sure. Um, and I think that, 
you know, young people laughing at old people is nothing new, and I hope they continue to do so. <laughs> However, old people laughing at young people is nothing new, and I hope they continue to do so. Otherwise, I got nothing to laugh about. The, right. The um, there's the the particularly in this town, you know, where you see people who will mutilate themselves in surgery to avoid the process of aging, which I kind of. Like, get tattoos or something. It's much much more fun, you know, and, and it also covers up all the light. My wrinkly elbow skin, <laughs> try and find it. Yeah. <laughs> Look out for the spider web. Yeah. yeah, now I understand why people are getting yeah. that tattoo. Um, the first thing I wrote down is how much of a genuine fan I am of your writing style, both in your novel, Between the Bridge and the River, as well as your memoir, American on Purpose, The Improbable Adventures of an Unlikely Patriot. I'd like to get the whole title out. Tell me uh, what you can, please, about the second novel, The Sphinx of, of the Mississippi. Um, about halfway through it, actually, I, I've, I've been working on this uh, book for a long time. When you, when you do a daily show, it slows you down. I had started writing The Sphinx of the Mississippi um, just after I started Late Night. Oh, my. And uh, there was just no way. I that just was a 10-year run. Yeah, I just couldn't do it. Uh, and then when I stopped late night, I kind of got fat and grew my hair long for a bit. You know, you have to go through a process. Um, but now I've, I've picked up that book and I'm, I'm running at it now. It's, it's uh, and now it has, a now when I read it, I go, oh really, okay, where are we going now? So I think it's, uh, right. I think maybe in a, in a, because I have another, I've done a deal to write another book, so I'll have to finish that book and then finish the Sphinx. So uh, okay, and is the other book another memoir or? It's sort of like that. It's uh, I'm calling it right now random access memoirs. I'm calling it, you know, that it's like it's stories which are kind of from the the it, the kind of back roads of my story. Like if you take the freeway, when someone pays you a gazillion dollars to write an autobiography when you're super famous, uh -huh. you take it and you write them the biography they want. Right. You know, I did this, I did that, here was the thing, bada bum, 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 bum. And that's what I did with American On Purpose. You try and make it, but you, there's no time to stop and go, well, actually, I lost my virginity here, I think. I'm not sure. And so right. what I've done is I, I've written, you get, I got used to the format of uh, monologues. Yeah. So I've written, I'm writing stories, I'm about, I've written about 15, I'm going to need about 30 stories which are about three to five thousand words long wow. and they just you can They're read monologue. them anyway just monologue length yeah. yeah so it's just like bum, 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 and and they are in this book which will come out i think about a year from now because stand-up to you has always been about storytelling it's never been about jokes yeah i mean it, it's nice to have a joke sure you know you i mean can pepper a story with a laugh yeah i mean i i i feel like that the old groucho uh, adage of just keep talking long enough you're about to say something funny right. you know i mean just just keep going yeah. and I think if there's a there's a, a an English comic who I'm a, a big fan of who's actually become a sort of Shakespearean luminary now. But when I knew him, he was a he was a baggy pants comic. His name's uh, Lenny Henry. You know Lenny? Oh, sure, I saw him uh, in, in the West End doing what was the he did the. Um, not Bobby Darren, the other very troubled. Anyways, it'll come to me. Yeah, but I saw him in the West End, and he was. He's an astonishing, astonishing performer, and he, he's one of these guys. He was a performer when he was a kid, and he was on kids TV when I was a kid. I used to watch him and stuff. So, I mean, like he's only I think he's only about five or six years older than right. me, Lenny. And, um, but Lenny uh, had always had this thing. I remember having lunch with him years and years and years. I used to go out with a girl that was friends with his wife, and we had, I was invited to Sunday lunch, which was a big deal, you know, to, to hang out with Lenny. And he, he was talking about stand-up, and he said, I don't think you have to be the funniest guy to be a success. I don't think being funny is really what it's about. It's about being charismatic and charming. It's what it's about. People want to watch it. People want to do what you have to say. Like, right. you know, there's a lot of people who, whose jokes are great. I don't, I don't want to see them. Yeah, you know? I find myself when, when I'm watching an act that's, that's written as jokes, at some point, I just get a little numb to it. Yeah. I can find them funny, but I'm not laughing. Or even just if their personality doesn't mesh with that one, you're not going to like everybody. And, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's like, look, I, can, I know that uh, Thelonious Monk was a fantastic musician, but that type of music does nothing for me. Right. So it just does nothing for me. I, it's, neither, it's neither a comment on him or no. on the music or on no, his I, personality. Or it. It's just about, this is about me. Yeah. Some people like fish, some people like chicken. 
Some people don't eat either. That's right. Yeah. Oysters are mussels, Antoninus. <laughs> uh. Uh, authors that inspired you because your writing is so specific and so damn wonderful. Thank you. Who well, were you reading coming up? The first, I think the first book I read of any great value, uh, other than childhood kind sure. of stuff. Uh, well, th well, the first book I remember reading right. was uh, uh, Tom Sawyer. Sam Clemens all the way for me. Really? All the way. Yeah. That's I where kinda, I learned. I think you'll like the Sphinx then. Oh, good. Yeah, because he's in it a little bit. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I got this. I had this idea of having this. I, I, I don't want to talk too much about the book, but in the book, uh, two of my main characters, one of them dies, but has uh, there's some extenuating circumstances, a book to book. And so they go uh, upstream at night up the Mississippi while uh, Huck and Jim are coming down <laughs> and they pass each other on the way. That's beautiful. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can legally do that, so I'll have to work it out with a, uh, with a but I, I just like the idea of, of in the collective consciousness that these things are uh, occurring at the same time yes. because time is meaningless in fiction. Right. But that being said, um, uh, the first book I remember reading is, is Tom Sawyer, right. uh, and I, it was the one that I used to go to when I was a kid, when I was uh, experiencing adolescent difficulty, uh, you know, unrequited love, uh, un unexpected emissions, whatever it was, um, uh -huh. the, uh, that that book was a source of great comfort to me. And then the next one I remember reading that sh shook me to the core was 1984. Oh yeah. Um, well, that's a leap. Well, it, it's in a way, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's a leap, but it's kind How of... How old were you? I was you about 16 when yeah, I read 1984. Yeah. But I can still remember. I remember reading. I remember picking up the book and it says, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks had just struck 13. And I was like, I'm in. Yeah. Whatever that is, I'm in. What something is... Ter oh, clearly, everything looks okay, but something is terribly wrong. Yeah. It's what's being said in one sentence. It occurred to me then that perhaps Mr. Orwell or Eric Arthur Blair could write. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. In, and in one sentence, you're in. I like that. I yeah. like first lines of, of books. I like it. I think it's a very important... It's like first impressions. It, it, uh, when I go out on stage, in my mind, I've got 15 seconds to relax their sphincters. Yep, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's why, great day for America. I, ju yeah. I just want, yeah, I just want them yeah. to know they're in good hands. Yeah, that's it, don't worry, I got this. Yeah. yeah. And it's, whether it's the first line of a book or a first line, I mean, you write pretty well yourself. That screenplay that you showed me. <laughs> You've only recently learned. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's pretty good, man. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. It's very good. Uh, I, I, well, then let's talk uh, the discipline of writing because that's something that fascinates me to no end. H how are you? Do you go when the muse arrives? Can yeah, you if you want to slow things down, you go when the muse arrives. Right. You, the muse will arrive if you park your ass in front of the machine and go. You know that. Yeah. Um, I think the. Uh, you know the funny. It's weird the sources you get for inspiration. Sure. Recently, the person that's helped me most with writing is uh, Bob Saget. Please continue. Because <laughs> I, I tell you what, Bob said to me, he said, I, I, I did my autobiography. I went, really? He, uh, and, and, you know, I said, how did you do it? And he said, four hours a day. I sat down, no matter what was I going to do, I was going to sit at the machine for four hours. If I wrote something, I wrote it. If I didn't, I didn't. But I, was gonna, I gave four hours every day to the machine. And I was like, you know what, that's right. And yeah. so I tried that a little bit. Uh, and it, it really works. Yeah. Although now I'm writing Bob Saget's autobiography, <laughs> which is a shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no question about creating discipline versus thinking about it. Cause it's enjoyable to think about how good your, go your book is going to be, but it doesn't write it. No. It, you got to write it. Yeah. And that sensation will only become completely real as you're writing it. Yeah. And when you, when you feel that... As you write Momentum. it, and also you, you get to read it, and you get to reread it, and you get to play with it, and then when you press send and it goes to the publisher, that's it. It's not yours anymore. Well, how are you with the first draft? Because my feeling has always been throw it up, get it out there, get it over with, because the draft 
joy of writing for me is actually in rewriting. Sure. I'm not going to spend any time on the first draft. It's a skeleton. Yeah, but, that, but uh, it depends on what you define a first draft as. I mean, a first draft for me, like I get to the end of the book and then I go back and start writing it again, right? That's first draft. But to some people, a first draft is what they send their publisher. You know, the legal first draft sure. versus the... Are you, when you go back the next day, are you reading what, or uh, the, pretty much, the entirety yeah. of what you No, because, uh, because at a certain point it becomes too long. You right. spend half your day rereading yourself yeah. and to me that in the feels bag. like a trap. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But you know, I, I read go back a couple of pages, sure. and Again. then and then you know, oh, it, everybody's different. But I. I like to kind of write it and then go back and make things happen there that pay off there. Yeah. It's, it's fun. Yeah. You did that in that screenplay. I can see you did that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yes, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I'm, I don't know that there was, was, was there encouragement for any particular classmate or teacher? You know, I, I find this area only interesting if there was, so if there wasn't. Well, a, a mentor type person? You know, I had an English teacher who turned me on to Sam Clemens a whole semester. Right. And that's where I, I you know, he, he, you could be argued that he was the first stand-up comedian in America. Sure, I'd say that. I think there's a direct line from, uh, from Mark Twain to... Uh, to uh, God, who's the big Spalding Gray? To um, who, who's yeah. the big kind of monologist now? I guess um, Chappelle, maybe Louis C.K. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, um, social satirist. Uh, yeah, much more in tune. Yeah, um, and talking about uh, the structure of man and woman and society. And yeah, it's an existentialist examination. I mean, it's just in the form of you use humor. Because, but I think that's probably been done for years. This is, I was talking to some, a friend of mine who's a very committed uh, Christian. And, uh, and she was uh, like, talking about you know, Jesus and all the stuff he said. And I said, I'm, I imagine, I don't speak Aramaic. I'm not, certainly not a theologian. Hmm. Uh, I don't speak ancient Greek or even any kind of Greek. I don't know if there's a difference between ancient and modern Greek. But my guess is that any prophet, Moses, Jesus, any of these people, uh, they were hilarious. Mm. That's, that's my guess. How else could you have a Because you know, you know, it's like, come and see this guy talk for, you know, an hour and a half yeah. on a rock about, you know, about scary sh shit. No one's <laughs> coming to that. But if you go, we got to go and see uh, Moses. He's hilarious. He's hilarious. He's got that whole thing. You, have you seen the bit where he talks about the sea? <laughs> the sea and the sea going, that goes there, that goes there. And these guys go through there. These guys go, hot pockets. Oh, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, it's like his bet. It's his bet. Yeah, you can't do the Red Sea. That's yeah, Moses. Right. That's what. And the, the, the thing about, you know, I almost, I, the example I use to try and to accelerate my point is the, uh, the quote from the Bible about it is easier for a cat to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven or something like that. Now, that sounds kind of dusty and biblical, but I'm guessing in ancient Aramaic, that is a fucking great joke. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that is like, camel's in the eye of the needle! Do the camel's in the eye of the needle! And so it is easier. He's going to do it! He's going to do it! Hard pockets! Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're 100% spot on. Yeah. The, the camel was a spitter. I think that's what it is. I think that I think sometimes we, listen. If I ever see any of my stuff written down from a gig, like you, you know, in bad reviewers, oh my god, write down your material, and, and it looks garbage. Yes. Yeah, I think that happened to a lot of the uh, of it, the it old time prophets. So for sure, it was written up. You, you get some, you know, old monk is like mm, writing down your joke. Guy walks into bar. <laughs> <laughs> Half a page. Why the long face? <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, and 200 years, historians tell us, it was 200 years after the death 
of Christ? That before? I don't know anything yeah. about that, yeah. but it was a while. Yeah, yeah. it was a while. It, it's all, like, it depends on who you talk to. No, that's And there's, that's and there's plenty it. of people I don't <laughs> want to talk to. About right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. You're yeah. not going to change my mind and I'm not going to change yours. So let's leave it at that. Yeah, you have to leave it at that. That's, yeah. that, that is the only way out. I uh, think so. I would like to know a little bit about the experience of, of uh, being awarded the Peabody Award. Uh, the interview, of course, with Desmond Tutu. Well, that's a different thing entirely. It is. Know? Yeah, that, the, it, Tutu was, a, was definitely a fork in the road for me. Um, because I was in the position of, it's a strange kind of position, because on one, the one hand, you're very honored to be uh, put into the position where you get to interview a figure like that on uh, on television or anywhere, just talk to them. Um, so, so that was interesting. But there was the other thing was that I kind of connected with this human being. Now I don't know if that's part of uh, Father Tutu's charisma uh, and and spectacular personality, or if I really did connect. Either way, it doesn't matter because what happened was that he changed my mind about something. I was trying to fit into what I thought a late night host should be. And he said to me, you are crazy. I said to him, you, you've, you've met some really crazy people, Bishop Tutu, that uh, he said, no, no, no. You are crazy in the way we need. You have to be more crazy. Now, he doesn't actually talk like Dracula, but that's as close <laughs> as I can get to his voice. And. Um, and I and I felt like there was be it, more the, crazy. Be be as crazy as you want because whatever crazy you are is valuable. Be more that's you. What he's, yeah. And so when he did that, I thought, well, that's kind of like a celestial invitation to say fuck it and do what you want. Very quickly after uh, Bishop Tutu comes the dancing horse, the talking skeleton, the fucking rhino in the wall, yeah. the, all that shit. And then me going fuck it and leaving. You know, all of that shit. It was bum 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 bum. That's yeah. the dominoes after yeah. after Tutu. Yeah. He opened things up. Yeah, because because he's fucking <laughs> Desmond Tutu. Yeah, you know, and it's with not like you know a guy at, at the comedy store who went. No, you know no. what you should do, buddy. <laughs> you know, he's but but he but that same charm and charisma that we're assuming Moses had. Right, for sure. For sure. Yeah. You know, I think successful preachers even now, it's not a world I know much about, but my guess is people who are working these uh, big mega churches and stuff, they're charismatic. They'd have oh, to of course. be. They would have to be. Jim Jones. Uh, uh, Sam. Sam Kinison was a preacher before yeah. he was a stand-up. Yeah. Um, there's, a I new, can see, there's a definite connection. There's a new book um, uh, out. I uh, listened to the author talk about it on the Jim Jones and the Guyana yeah. situation. That wasn't that funny, I don't think. Uh, I would like to see some of the punchlines because I, I, I'm, I'm unaware thus far that there <laughs> were any. But a sense of charm uh, that is... Oh, Jones must have had? Yeah, daunt For sure. daunting yeah. and unstoppable. For sure. Yeah, yeah charismatic. Remember uh, Richard Jenny, uh, the late Richard Jenny, mm. lovely Richard, you know, God yeah. bless him, wherever he is, uh, who used to do a great bit about uh, how he appreciated Charlie Manson. And I was like, where are you going with this man? Because this is bleak. And he said, well, Charlie Manson, he used to do it in stand-up. He said, Charlie Manson had a, you know, he tattooed a swastika on his forehead. So you know he's fucking crazy right, right away. <laughs> You're not like going, is he crazy? Yeah. Is he not crazy? It's yeah. like, he's crazy. He's letting you know. Yeah, yeah. Right out of the show. Right, he's letting you know. <laughs> Let's not debate whether I'm crazy, folks. I've got a tattoo. It was an offshoot about dating. He said, I wish my more dates would give is me that an what easier it was? sign. Is that what it was? Yeah. I wish my dates would give me an easier sign so I could sit down and go, this motherfucker's crazy. <laughs> I can tell right here. He's got this monster on his face. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about this. Um, you had Don Rickles on the show. Oh, many times. Yeah, yeah I knew Don well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit you care to share with this man who, who was on Mount Rushmore for me, too. Uh, Rickles was... Uh, I met Rickles through Peter LaSalle. When I started doing Late Night, uh, Peter LaSalle, who was my producer, produced Carson for 30 years, the, you know, this giant of, of broadcasting. Um, I was trying out for the late night show and uh, I was doing a bit uh, dressed as Elvis. Um, and um, I went into Peter's office to show him the costume and he said, oh, I'm on a conference call with uh, Regis Philbin and Don Rickles. Uh, 
do you want to talk to them? I'm like, yeah. So I get on this <laughs> conference call, and you, you don't really. T if Regis and Don Rickles are on the phone, I didn't say much. No one's talking. But, uh, but I get introduced to him. So when I get the job, I call him up. And I say, will you come and be on the show? And he said, I'll wait and see if you're a hit. <laughs> I'll wait and see if the show's a hit. That's beautiful. Yeah, and then he was on two weeks later. Yeah, yeah so, of course. You know, but he, uh, he, he was beautiful, charming, yeah. talented, genius. You know, I mean, everything that everybody says about him, he's lovely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Barbara, his wife, who was this, uh, uh, he would say himself, the, the, the kind of the guide in his life the, the steering forward the it was a real partnership oh yeah and I think if you do if you describe his you know obviously to most people they don't know Barbara but 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 the real story you know most of the iceberg is under the water do you know what I mean is like Barbara it was it was an enormous power and that, and I think Don would have been the first one to say that he was yeah uh, also an act that was born on stage it was the startling wonderful extraordinary thing to me about what he did. Yeah. Um, the, the very first time listening to him talk about it, that he performed the, the first many times, there was nothing written down. He just went out and had, had to fill some time. Yeah. And found that by making fun of everyone seated, we could get through this. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> it's that thing Leno says. Leno's not much in fashion with the young comedians right now, but he's a great stand up. And, and, uh, and the, you know, technically great. Whether it's to your taste or not is up to you. But Jay always said, they don't know the script. They don't know the script. Just keep talking. <laughs> See all these young comedians trying to learn your lines? Who fucking cares? <laughs> it's not like the audience is going, you missed a bit. You know? It's like, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, there was a, definitely a, a great many moments in time when he was Yoda. When I first got to town, um, I mean, you know, when, when Letterman had him on as the guy in the leather vest, yeah. he was king shit. Yeah. And, and I remember well, there was a time when it's very well known, very well documented, Robin Williams couldn't stop himself from reciting other people's act. Was, uh, and I even gave him... Uh, as much leeway as to say he was a kleptomaniac because his genius was having no editor in his head. So as he was rapid fire, things were coming out of his face. There was no one in there like the rest of us who goes, no, no, that's actually Tim's bit. Mm -hmm. So when he did one of mine, I mean, there was a point where, again, well documented, if you called his attorney and, and told him the, the, the talk show and the date of the talk show, they would just automatically send you a check for $1,500. So there was a, a moment in time where he did one of my bits, and we were friendly, and I l l always loved him, uh, but on the Academy Awards. And so I was saying to Leno, so this, this, I, my fear is that I'm going to do it in my act, and they're going to say you're stealing from Robin Williams. Because mm -hmm. I didn't have many jokes that you could steal. Right. <laughs> you right. know, this was not a bad one. Uh, I had an uncle who was a faith healer. Of course, he was a Jewish faith healer, so he did things a little differently. He would heal people by comparing his illnesses to theirs. <laughs> oh, you have, a, you have your sprains your ankle? I have a growth on my colon the size of your face. How do you feel now, Mr. Ankle? So, <laughs> it's a joke joke. Yeah, yeah. So, Leno, as Yoda at the fireplace with the pipe, literally, says, oh yeah, Robin took one of your jokes. Yeah, right, you wanna know what to do. Well, I think, uh, fairly obvious, you want to write yourself a new joke. <laughs> <laughs> And it was kind of stunning, uh, set me back in my seat, not the compassion I was looking for, and the exact advice one needed in that moment. Well, it's gone. It's kind of, yeah, the, the harm's done. The only time I really got mad about that kind of thing is I had a writer that wrote me a joke, that wrote me a joke. Oh. Oh man, that, that burned. I don't even want to name the joke or the writer involved, but I fired him. And that, sometimes I think that happens and comics don't even see it. Right. You know, it's like that late night guy did that joke and that late night guy did that joke. You, you, it's, these guys are reading a prompter. You're bum, 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 bum. The yeah. jokes are coming fast. So, you know, sometimes you, an unscrupulous writer will sure. put a joke in yeah. that doesn't belong to them. Right, and uh, not always do they get caught. And they don't always get caught. Some, most of the time they get caught, but sometimes they don't. Yeah. It made me so fucking mad. Uh, that was bad. Yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, especially when you take pride of not being that guy. You don't want to be that guy, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Very few comedians have survived hosting the White House Correspondents Association dinner, and even fewer are celebrated for attempting to grab the horns of that particular bull. You hosted when George W. Bush was prez, and you found a way to embrace and thrive in that outing. So I have to ask you, how would you handle it with today's fearless leader? I wouldn't do it. Right. I wouldn't do it, no. I, I wouldn't do it. Um, I think it's kind of like, I went diving with sharks once. I'm really glad I did it. I'm not fucking doing it again. He Why do you like, think you did it? Uh, I was uh, just like my country. I was young, scrappy, and hungry. I was, you know, I was like, I, I was... Uh, um, Trying to prove you can do it to yourself? I think so. I think also I'd just become a citizen. Right. Uh, and I, and I, I felt like it kind of felt right. You know, I'd been asked to do it. And then the truth is I'd never watched it. I, I saw you, uh, when's the last time I saw you? A couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Because I actually watched it for the first time after that. I just watched it like a week ago. Of you diving? Of me doing it. It's pretty good. <laughs> the only thing I looked at, but you know, as I watched it, I went, yeah, I was pretty fat. I, I was ca <laughs> carrying a lot of weight. That's what you noticed. Yeah, well, that's what you notice. You know, I mean, you know this. <laughs> and you haven't eaten since. Yeah, no, I'm like, God, I got uh, But it was, a, it was a decent, it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it, to it's, survive and it's about as hard a stand up as can be done. You know, I, I don't know. And I, and I watched a couple of other people, I'm not going to name them because I'm not going to do that, but with varying degrees of success, I thought, bullshit, crap, not even a stand-up, oh fuck, I wish I could be that good, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's nearly impossible to, to succeed as well as you believe the material should. Yeah, well, it's kind of like... It's a weird room. It's a weird room. It's, it's like, I've said this before, but it's like a dream, like really like a dream. Like, yeah. you know, the Jonas Brothers are there and <laughs> Christian Amanpour is sitting with them and Pamela Anderson and your, your old fifth grade teacher wearing a thong. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the, what the hell is going on? Yeah, you know. yeah. it is a, a surreal painting in front of it you. It is, it's weird. Did you ever do it? No, no. Would you do it now? I've, I've been there to see it. Yeah, would, would you do it now? No, of course not. No, I don't think Trump, he, Trump didn't go the last one, did he? No, I don't, no, I don't it just was. happened. First president since Reagan to not be at the Correspondence Center. In and Reagan's, Reagan's defense, defense he, was, he had been he'd shot. He'd been shot. Yeah, yeah, I mean. He'd been I think, hospitalized. Yeah, and he still phoned something in, yeah. I think, yeah. The uh, last couple of years of his administration. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, no, hey, he now. something else. Hey, now. Uh, yes. Yes, this is the first time. That, that, that well, it's all it's all different now. It's all everything. It's everybody, you know, people wanted it to be different. Well, now it's different. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Yep. Every day, it's another thing. You know, it's an interesting thing. It makes me very glad I'm not in the position of what the late night guys are doing now. I, I say guys in the non-gender specific. Uh, right. Yeah. But the. Um, you know the uh, doing the uh, doing navigating that world right now. Uh, you know, it's like knowing half of the audience is going to hate you every night. This is the thing. You know, when I do stand-up, I, I was always an escapic, escapist act in that I wanted the audience to leave all their troubles at the door. We weren't going to talk about much. And then at some point... Well, that's were, your job, man. Right. You know. So I found a funny way to talk about religion that didn't uh, right. cast out my opinion on anything. Yeah, most and I people found, can, take, I think, take a joke as right. long as you don't... Uh, patronize them or hit them head on or tell them they're wrong. Right. You know, I mean, just... Which is the issue now facing a uh, political point of view. So I go on stage and I broach the subject and then I, I get silly. Yeah. Um, as opposed to talking about an issue that's going to divide the audience in a nanosecond. Yeah, well, you know, I was just before the election, I was doing a gig in the Chicago theater. Mm. Uh, it's a big theater, yes. big downtown American Saturday night show. You know, people have got babysitters, the parking lot, the guy with the flags, the, the whole thing, right? Yeah. And a fight breaks out in the front row. I'm like, it, what? You know, and it's, a, you know, I, I, somebody, I'd done a joke about Trump. Somebody thought it was pro-Trump, th somebody thought it was anti-Trump. It was neither. It was just a joke about Trump. And they fought. And they fought each other. Uh, it was crazy. That is crazy. crazy. to see it. Um, and they both got thrown out, which I think, fair play to the Chicago Police Department. Yes, well. And the finally, audience as well. Finally, fair play from the Chicago Police Department. Um, it wasn't the same people who did the plane. No, no. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the same people who got the Asian guy off no, the United those, flight. Those were airport police, yeah, totally different beasts. They're a different thing, yeah. Uh, it is, I will say this, uh, both sides 
have been fueled by their opinion and stance and feelings, and you can't argue that. That, that you know, it's easy to, to be outraged, but they're, both sides are outraged now. Well, they're both outraged. And what I think is interesting as well, that neoliberalism says that if you don't speak out against that guy, you are with that guy. Right. Uh, and I'm like, well, well, that makes me with you then? Yeah. So I've got to be with you? Right. Well, I'm not sucking your dick or his dick. Right. Fuck you. Yeah. But goddamn fucking American. Which means you put America before you put your party. It, I thought that was a fucking idea, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, but who knows? <laughs> Careful, something slipped out. Yeah. It was not just your coffee cup. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, this is interesting to maybe just me. <laughs> what? Uh, by way of example of how you are someone who is just trying to get by, these are your words, you once said <laughs> that if you were in World War II, you would have been a black marketeer. I think that's probably true. Uh, I think I would have been what they call a spiv in Britain. Somebody that was selling nylons in the black market. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, don't, I, I hope I wouldn't be. I hope I would have been a, a brave soldier at the front. But I suspect I would have been a sniveling coward uh, trying to sleep with all, everybody's wife while sure, we were, sure. were in the war. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important to know that about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I try not to be that now. Yep. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You try to stand for something a little more. Yeah. Um, and as that black marketeer, what could you now imagine would have been your top selling item? Oh, iPhones, I would sure. Something. <laughs> iPhones or iPhone covers. Yeah. <laughs> right. Hey, hey, you want an iPhone cover, baby? Get over here. Hey. Uh, okay, so um, we talked a little bit about the piloting. I, I would like to know. Um, the, anything about the many emotions or experiences that come from being in that, what I imagine to be at times, uh, otherworldly place, uh, soaring above the planet, at, at your, your hands at, at the controls? It's certainly a surreal thing to fly an airplane on your own uh, at first, and maybe always, but certainly at first. Um, you. Uh, I got uh, one of my first flights on my own. I got in a little trouble with some uh, mountain wave, which is a form of turbulence, which is to be avoided if you can. And um, as I was in it, because it was Kurt Russell had got me into flying, uh, and I'd been talking to Kurt Russell, and I, you know, I, and he's a big American movie star. Yeah, yeah. So also America. He's America. yeah. He is America. <laughs> yeah, good luck pinning him down on whatever fucking color you want him to wear. Uh, uh, that's what you know. What that's to, that yes. if, when Snake Plissken runs for president. That's who I'm with. Yeah. Only until someone says you're Snake's guy, and then I have to leave. Uh, <laughs> that's right. But um, but I was uh, I was in some trouble, and and I earlier on, and uh, I was talking about fear with with Kurt. Uh, at dinner once and he said uh, I said I said I want to find out what's on the other side of that fear and he said what's on the other side of that fear Craig is you which sounds like a line from a movie right mm -hmm. so I'm in trouble in the plane not trouble but I'm kind of scared uh, and I can hear in my head Kurt Russell remember it's, Kurt, it's not just anybody's voice no. it's Kurt Russell going on the other side of the fear <laughs> is you and he's kind of like you know they're fading them in a little bit they're like a crossfade edit and I'm like ah! the other side of the fear is you and you just got to get to it. Yeah, it was kind of, it's kind of wild. It was interesting. Uh, I don't like being afraid. I, I don't. I really don't seek it out. I really don't. My but default is anger. When I'm afraid. Yeah. I, get angry. I think the other side of the anger is fear, and then the other side of the fear is you. Right. Uh, that'll be 150 bucks for the. Other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got off cheap. Yeah. yeah. Really did. Uh, yes. Um. So I asked uh, about what influences music or entertainment you pass along to your boys um, I, 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 I'm curious I, I mean it's easy for me to assume you're giving them a lot more freedom than you had or is that not that's just my assumption no I think that I think that they to find think, their way I think I had a lot of freedom hmm. I just think that it was I, I don't know that freedom is so good for kids 
Right. I think I think freedom with guidance. Yeah, I think discipline is good for kids. I, I think that you know, I think loving discipline is good for. I don't I don't know if it's good for all kids, but it, they're my kids. This is my you know, this is the best I can do. Is the best idea I can come up with. Is go, you know, they don't get freedom. You know, when people say, I, I always get that with child actors. You know that, like, would you ever put your kids on stage? I'm like, no, never. They said, but he loved doing it. You go, you know what? He also loves to stay up to three o'clock in the morning and eat fucking Oreos. I'm not letting him do it. You right, know, right. there's information that has to be imparted. So, did it know, come naturally to you to be a disciplinarian? I don't, I don't know if I'm a am I a disciplinarian. Well, you're setting boundaries. Yeah, I which think, means you I, have to discipline. I think that's I think that's human. Yeah, I think that that that's. Uh, it's the best I can do. I think I, I think love and discipline for in parenting are the same things. I don't think, you know, being, uh, you know, overtly strict with someone is of any use. But I think being kind of like, oh, we're just friends. You talk to my kids. I'm not their friend. I'm their dad. Yeah. You know, it's not. I'm not like, hey, you want to hang out, buddy? Like, if I said that to my 16-year-old, he'd be like, really, man? That's what we're doing? That's, that's what we're doing, Dad? It's like, you're my friend, but we're going to the mall, Dad? What, you know what, what, I mean? what do you imagine he makes of you? And is he in a place where he actually I think it's 16. I, I think it's 16. I don't want to embarrass him, but I think, I think a generic 16 is you're kind of more focused on where you're going in the world, and it's like it's about your thing, and right. your dad is just your, you know, with any luck, your dad's just your dad, and he's there if you need him. Yeah. That's what I want it to be for my kids. Right. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll use that piece of equipment when necessary, but in the meantime, I've got high school to navigate. Yeah, you know? sure. I think that, that's the way. And if you heard someone talking shit about you, uh, I think he'd probably get involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, that's what it boils down to. Sure, when yeah. you've 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 done the best you could and earned the respect that would arise in that situation. You hope so. You hope so. I mean, the the, the other thing is, you know. People talking shit about people. I mean, it used to be something that you would hear it and it would have a reaction. Like, it, you go on any social media, go in the, look at the comments on this thing right now. I bet there's fucking 150 people telling you what a fucking douchebag a guy am. Like, I give a fuck about, you know. Right, you know, but that's their only outlet. Well, fine, you know, I mean, that's fine, but, but it's still talking shit. Yep. You know, talking shit about people, weirdly enough, if I do it, because I made a, a point of this during late night, I made right. a very, you know, a, a 90 degree, 180 degree turn, which was talking shit about people makes me feel bad. Right. You know, so when, like, all the, the, the people that are going on hating everything they see on social media or on the media or everywhere, it's because they're in agony. But they're compounding their agony by doing that. Because I don't believe, this is a definite manifesto for me, I do not believe that thought, pre, uh, thought makes behavior. Mm. I believe behavior makes thought. So, if you want to be a good person, job number one, do something nice. Right. Resist the temptation to be a dick. Right. And then, very quickly, the universe will start stop making you a dick. Right. You'll stop feeling like a dick because you're not acting like a dick. You don't act like a dick, you're not a dick. Like, sometimes I want to do some really fucking awful shit, but I don't do it. Therefore, not in jail. You know, I mean, it's... <laughs> uh, it's very, very basic to say do unto others, but man, oh man. Yeah. That one speak has always spoke volumes. Yeah, you to just, me. just behave right. If I want respect, I have to give it. You should know the chat room is overwhelmingly positive, but there are many requests for subtitles, whatever that means. <laughs> really, <laughs> subtitles? <laughs> Even after all this time, <laughs> Dude, when I became an American citizen, the governor of California couldn't even fucking pronounce California. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, California. Like it. Truth. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, you had obviously a historical turning point on the show when the whole Britney Spears thing came up and you broke ranks from everyone else doing that job and doing any form of comedy, really, who was not necessarily even taking pot shots, but just seeing an opportunity that um, someone that they deemed uh, uh, spoiled and created their own hellish environment should have the piss taken and uh, yeah mental illness which I believe is what that right. young lady was suffering right. from at that point in her life is not something people choose of their own volition no you know and nobody listen I'm a fucking alcoholic if I was given a choice would I have gone that way 
I'm guessing no. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, like, right. But uh, yeah. but that but that was the reality of it. And so, am I saying this is a, a thing people always say about alcoholics? You know, that saying you're an alcoholic is just a cop out. And you go cop out what? I paid everybody back. I went back and fucking took care of all the shit that I didn't. I, to the best of my ability, I made everything fucking. Where the fuck did I cop out? Yeah. No. You, know, you, you had to work much harder. You had you, copping out is saying, oh, run. That's copping out. Right. Walking back into it and facing and all the stupid shit you've done, yeah. taking responsibility for it and trying to make it right, hardly seems to me like a cop out. It seems like the opposite of a cop out. No, that's the most craziest. In fact, we're going to have to take away some of the points of you working in the black market because the guy who is not able to face what's coming at him in the most challenging moment of your entire life, uh, I'm afraid kind of suggested some metal had been proven well what i'm saying to you is that sometimes we say the opposite of what is true and Most of the time. And, and that is a joke yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know when it's good enough you come back to it yeah i don't it. think there's uh, even if it's not good enough even if anybody remembers it it's still a still you know, a callback still a callback <laughs> that, that you will that you will be rewarded for um uh i, I can't thank you enough we are uh we are getting to that moment in the afternoon, and you've got the other side of town to get to. I have. Uh, what, what, uh, uh, are you able to detach from the mothership? What point in your life were you able to detach from the mothership in terms of choosing to take a vacation? Because the old adage is, if you want a gig, book a vacation. And in fact, for my big, fat 60th, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm booking a winner. And I'm not hoping at all I have to cancel, but assuming. So are you able to take a vacation? Detach and get away? Um, it's different to that. You know, vacations are for people that have jobs that yeah. the, they have to. No, no, our life is a vacation. Yeah, kind we, of. Yeah, you we know, work my, my old man took vacations, but right. I, uh, or holidays. But to me, know. there's a sense of living a, a lifestyle that you create your own hours for most of it that, in some ways, is the most difficult to take time off because the phone rings, you're a fireman. Um, no anymore. No anymore. The phone, I mean, I got offers after late night to do shows every day and I turned everything down. The, uh, the, the one that I did take was the serious radio show because they put a studio in, as you know, in the shed at the bottom of my garden. Uh, and even then, I think a few years now probably that'll be out of that too. Right. You know? It's just, that, you know, I have to be in town. It goes, goes back to the something. advice that I uh, loved uh, Eddie Izzard gave you on the, on the late night show. Yeah, yeah. You should do it, but don't do it more than a couple of years. A couple of years, that's all. That's what you'll be known for. Yeah. You'll be that guy. But you know what? I don't care what I'm known for now. No. Because it's such a, it's such a short run anyway. People I found uh, when I hosted a game show and worried, what does this mean? Uh, I found if people liked what you're doing, that's all that matters to them. Stop judging yourself on what show business is going to deem. Fuck show business. Yeah. So show business gave us all sorts of fucking crap. You, you want to see show business? Go right. and watch fucking E! Entertainment Television or the fucking whatever the fuck's playing in the multiplex. Then fuck show business. Fuck them all. Punk fucking rock. You know what? I'll do what I fucking want yeah. in a country where I can still, for the most part, do what I fucking want. <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah. and everybody getting all mad to each other about you don't think like me. That's the fuck fucking point yeah that's the fucking point there's a lot I have told you today about friends of my I have a friend who is a committed Trump supporter he's my friend right. I am not a committed Trump supporter yeah I have a friend we play who's, poker with one every week right I have a friend who is a fundamentalist Christian I am not a fundamentalist Christian right. I have another friend who is an atheist I am not an atheist w why do we all have to be the fucking same yeah. what's interesting is is when we don't think the same right that's what's interesting yeah and who wants to free sit around oh fucking yeah I think this I think that too. Hurrah, we are great. Fuck those guys. <laughs> and on that note, uh, how do you close a show? You close a show by your guest saying, fuck those guys. <laughs> there you uh, go. I feel better now. We got it out. This, <laughs> by, by the way, this is very strong call. <laughs> um, 
Thank you for reading my script, let alone liking it. That meant a lot to me because I have such genuine respect for you good as a script, writer. Kevin. It's really and I've good. tried to say this many times today because I want it on oh, the record. Oh, I, I heard you. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you I, just I, didn't hear me telling you that your script is no, good no, no. that makes you uncomfortable. I, I, I uh, need uh, praise until it's given. Mm -hmm. And then it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, is that just if I, uh, I'm, I'm just afraid of agreeing and therefore coming off as, yeah, I think that's what that is. Yeah. I, you know what, time's up and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be $150. I think it's $275. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, my friend. You did such a great Larry King last time and it went viral. I will just ask people to go to the YouTube and watch his Larry King from last time. We're not going through that again. I don't have to do it this time? No, well, unless you want to, because it, it is historical on this show, your Larry King. Oh, is it? Then let's leave it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really did stand out yeah. from 306 yeah. of these, <laughs> yeah. uh, honestly and truly. Uh, meant the world to me, not just the long drive. Uh, thank you, man. All right. Always a pleasure, my dear. Okay. Sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the folks who uh, decided to stay with us. Uh, we're going to go to uh, J-Mac. I don't even know if I found out who was in the crow. Is that the Dooms? Yeah. The Dooms up there. I never even knew. Came in late in the middle of a show. Uh, thank you, Mike Dooms. Thank you, Jason McIntyre. Uh, uh, Luke Allen. Always getting it done. Sam Sammy Levine. Eh. See you Tuesday. Yep. D uh, Evil Dr. Chen, thank you, sir. Want to hear more about Disney? And uh, Jamie, we missed. We can't wait to hear about that. Uh, I believe we'll be back here next week with Dave Foley. I believe that's the plan. Mm -hmm. Foley's fucking crazy. Right? Way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that. Let's play that for him next yeah, week. Yeah. And he doesn't have the decency to put a swastika on his head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Although, yeah, you, just, you know what? He might. <laughs> yeah. <if> you, tell. <laughs> you need 90 seconds with him. Did you, see, did you see Foley in Veep where he plays the Prime Minister of Norway's husband? So fantastic. So it's about the f <laughs> it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'm, my God. And I love that show. That's a great show. Yeah, that is a great show. I think it's the funniest half hour on television. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's not even just funny. It's better than funny. It is. It's, it's fucking yeah, great. Yeah, if you can make me think that much yeah. and, and feel good about myself yeah, and thinking that much and laugh uncontrollably, you win. Uh, so congratulations, Pete. Uh, and Jaden Fox on makeup. That's it for uh, this particular one. Until next time, man, as always, get out of my face. <laughs>